Hey, this is Mike, and you're listening to a, a special, very special podcast edition of Real Black Radio. And uh, with us on the line is uh, a veteran writer, executive producer, showrunner, all that, all that, all that, Felicia <laughs> D. Henderson, who has, has a brand new show premiering on BET on uh, Wednesday, February 1st, called The Quad. Wel- welcome. It's great to talk to you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yes, yes, yes. Appreciate it very much. This is exciting. I mean, I, you know, I, it was off my radar, and then the new edition miniseries came on, and I saw the previews for Quad, and I was like, wow, I can't wait for this one. Oh, I'm glad to hear you say that, but because right before the new edition came on, I was complaining to BT, there are no promos. People don't know it's coming on. Where are the promos? And then, of course, new edition started, and they started playing the promos there, and, and it was new edition did very well. So luckily, that means lots of people know about us now. So for those who don't know, I mean, what, what can you tell us about the quad? Um, for those who don't know, uh, the quad is a new dr- one-hour drama uh, premiering on BET on Wednesday, February 1st at 10 p.m. Um, the, the, the premiere will be a two-hour movie, and then after that we go into the one-hour you know, drama episodes. Uh, but it's basically about um, Dr. Eva Fletcher, played by Anika Noni Rose, um, is a northern black who comes to... Uh, Georgia A&M University as its first woman president and believes that just because she is black, isn't all blackness the same? I, you know, she, so she goes to the South and thinks that she's going to fit in and take over and, you know, come in and, and, and quickly finds out there are a lot of things that are different there. And there is, even as blacks, we sometimes have to learn the lesson. There is no such thing as a monolithic black experience. Is this the very first show that you actually are a creator and showrunner, executive producer, or? No, gosh, no. Um, Soul Food was the first show that I created um, and then was the showrunner on. And that's actually where Charles Holland and I met was on, on, was on Soul Food. Charles Holland and I uh, co-created the series together. Um, it's hard to even call him like, you know, my, my, my colleague, he is my brother and nothing could make me happier than finally finding something for us to work on together. So after, uh, pitching this to BET, uh, with Rob Hardy, uh, BET said yes. And then I called Charles and said, please come and do this with me. And, and so we did and had a good time. And like I said, in addition to, uh, the Dr. Eva Fletcher character. It's also about six freshmen uh, coming into school. So not only is she starting over, but we have the six freshmen, uh, six freshmen from the freshman class who are also leaving home for the first time. And we follow their experiences as well. Right. So what inspired you to uh, tackle this story? I will tell you what inspired me is being approached by Rob Hardy, um, who, you know, went to Florida A&M and always wanted to, uh, you know, do a show that uh, told the stories of what it's like to go to an HBCU and what that world is and the specificity and of it and, you know, what it is. And my experience with it is that I, you know, had a niece who went to Clark Atlanta and I have a nephew who went to Morehouse. And, you know, so I, my experience was a financial one, (laughs) you know, (laughs) up until, uh, you know, Rob asked me to do this. And so I just spent a lot of time with him talking about everything he went, went through and, and experienced. And, you know, we have the, um, the Greek experience in common, uh, so he's an alpha and, and I'm a delta. So, you know, those kinds of experiences as well. And it's something that I be to the only place really to do it unapologetically. No. And so it's a perfect match for us. We don't always get a chance to see, like you said, unapologetic images of ourselves, especially in, in the realm of higher learning. It's very interesting to me, like how many people are still influenced by a different world, how that changed enrollment yes you know and that's really for us this is the next phase in in that exploration and one of the reasons that when we looked at we wanted to have like a you know a 
veteran scholar on campus who is a woman who champions uh, uh, Eva Fletcher coming to the school and who would play that woman who is Dr. Ella Grace Caldwell. It was immediately for us, it must be Jasmine Guy. Yes. Um, and luckily Rob had a, Rob Hardy had a relationship with her and we called her up and said, you must join us. And she did. And it, you know, she's so wonderful and it worked out really well. So it's, it's nice to have a connection with a different world, something that, you know, meant so much to me that I never missed an episode of that allowed me to have my first HBCU experience through, you know, watching that show. So it's very, very cool. And to be quite frank though, it's also scary because this school is completely fictional. Everything from the n- name of the school, you know, to the logo, like it was fun to create because I had to sit there and, and, and choose everything from will the mascot be a mountain cat or a tiger? Like all of that was, you know, fun. But at the same time, it's drama and it's complicated characters and they're not always, you know, perfect. In fact, they're never perfect. And yet we want to tell their stories. Um, And so you hope that people who go to or went to HBCUs come to the party and enjoy the full flavor of it and, and not be like, why are they showing that thing that isn't positive or that thing? Because, you know, you want to show us three dimensional, you know, fully formed characters. And, but it's scary because you don't want to turn anyone off. You want them to come and enjoy the experience. I think people are going to love this. I mean, we're speaking the day before the premiere. So I, I, I recognize the anxiety, but I mean, I, I think you know, you see, like, I, I think people had the same kind of anxiety about Greenleaf, which is going into season two, you know, but yeah, it's a behind the scenes of a mega church, but some of the, the biggest fans are, are people that know that world. And they say, yeah, that's that's true. Yes, that's very true. And that's what we're hoping for as well. And yet it also is for people like me who went to UCLA, you know, because some of the college experience is universal and having taught at UCLA and having, you know, attended there for undergraduate and graduate school, I've seen everything. And so part of what we also hope to do is be universal in our, you know, storytelling about again, those really formative years. Mm. Well, uh, speak to, I mean, in terms of education and breaking into the industry. Now, I mean, you, like I'm looking at your uh, credits, your first credit was Fresh Prince of Bel-Air on IMDb. I mean, you know how, I mean, it seems like this is a very opportune time now, especially for, uh, to create content with black folks in it. You know, how Mm -hmm. how did you start and how have things changed since... Well, you know, and my first credit was actually Family Matters. I go back even a little farther. My, I started my my writing career with Urkel. <laughs> and so, you know, when I started, there was obviously a lot of black family comedies on. And that's where it was easier to get your start if you were a young black writer. And so, you know, I went from Family Matters to um, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And then my mentors, whom I met on Family Matters, Sarah Finney Johnson and Vita Spears, co-created Moesha and asked me to join. And so, you know, and that was an amazing historical moment as well to be on this half hour comedy that was told from the point of view of this, you know, young urban black teen. So it was wonderful, but it was so back then when I was starting out in comedy, you know, 20 years ago, there were a lot of black comedies on television. And then of course we went through this serious um, drought where after first Fox and then, you know, uh, UPN and what used to be the WB, all the black comedies went there. And then once they got started and no longer needed them, you suddenly couldn't find them on television at all. And it was about that time that uh, I decided to try drama. I didn't know that that was going to happen, but I happened to transition into drama at just the right moment, or I probably would have been you know, unemployed along with a lot of my half hour comedy friends. So it was just, for me, the way that it has changed is that slowly but surely, I see, you know, comedy that features black um, 
characters coming back to mainstream television um, with the shows, the success of shows like Blackish, and that makes me very happy. Um, so how has it changed? Is that I I've, I've seen the you know I've gone from a time where black comedies were on every major network to oh my god we've disappeared from mainstream television to now okay it's coming back a little bit and of course the major change is from when I did my first drama which was the first successful you know black family drama soul food was the only game in town and I thought well surely the success of this will mean there'll be all kinds of black dramas now but that didn't happen and I pitched a lot of them, could not sell, get one sold. But now you see there's a black themed drama on almost every network yeah. and more than one. Well, so, and so that's also how things have changed. What do you attribute to that? Is, is it the, the own network or Shonda Rhimes? I mean, what was, what was the turning point where it, it shifted to one hour as opposed to half hour? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably more um, Shonda Rhimes than it is own. Because OWN sort of came along after this thing was already beginning. And so it's sort of in the middle of it, you know what I mean? In the, in the middle of this new arc of family dramas, uh, you have OWN there to take advantage of it and give us more opportunities with shows like, you know, Greenleaf and... Um, Queen Sugar. Oh, what is it called? Queen Sugar. Queen Sugar. Queen Sugar. Yeah, uh, how could I forget that? Which is just fabulous. And um, so I think that it's interesting because whereas show, Soul Food was about a black family, it was still just about family that happened to be black. But I think you go back to mainstream television and what, sh what Shonda Rhimes was able to do is to, you know, as she has said, you know, many times is to just go, I just want to cast the best actors and we'll look at everybody and may the best actor win. And of course, then that would end up being multicultural because no particular race or ethnicity, you know, is has the market cornered on being um, brilliant. There's brilliance, you know, in, in, in every people. Um, and so by doing that, it sort of normalized the idea of people of color um, being in such positions. So I think that that's where it really, we can start to see, you know, a, a big change. I know all your work. It's just, I didn't put the two, I mean, you know, like how, you know, like you go Urkel to yeah. Soul Food, you can't put together. This. <laughs> You're like, how long has she been working? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This is like, you, you all from the same mind is, is incredible. Right. Yes, that's true. I, that is my blessing. You know, that it's pretty much, I've gotten an opportunity to write everything from sitcoms, to action dramas, to, you know, family drama, to comic books. And it's just all been a joy. So, and, and this is now something else different and new that I hadn't, you know, written before. So I just, I feel very blessed to have had that oppor those opportunities. I can not let you go without mentioning Ruben Santiago Hudson, who plays the band director, who is, you know, Eva's main nemesis, because he is just so fantastic in it. And then we have this group of, like I said, freshmen and the actors, the, the, they're just so amazing. And some of them, you may have seen a little bit, some of them you've never seen, and they are all just really incredible and a wide range of characters and that hopefully everybody will find someone they can relate to. So Ms. Sanders, a two-pronged two question. One, words, yes. words of advice for up-and-coming writers who are, who are just getting into the writing programs or just wrote their first pilot school. Mm -hmm. And then second, what 2016, landmark year in terms of representation, um, you know, mm -hmm. what, what are the signposts, you know, do you think we're, we're here to stay or is it, is it just part of the cycle? Mm -hmm. Those are good, good questions. Um, I think when I think about talking to, you know, up and coming writers, first of all, I'm just a, a mentor and a teacher in my soul. I love working with young people. I love knowing that I have been even a small part of somebody, you know, getting that first uh, opportunity and strongly feel that if I, I as a black woman, um, am in the door, somebody else should have come through the door just because I was there. 
even on the quad, we had a Writers Guild of America trainee on the show. So um, uh, that's important to me. And I think what I say, particularly as you hear so many people talk disparagingly about millennials and the work ethic, that I am so happy to say I have found young people who still want to work hard. And there is just no substitute for being able, for being willing to work as hard as you have to, to get what you want. And I am fond of saying you will meet, you know, five people a day, or I will meet five people a day who are smarter than I am, but I'd never meet anyone who works harder than I do. Mm. And so I think that's very, very important. I think it's also, if you are a writer, you should be reading. Good writers come from being, you know, um, avid readers. And you must know the classics. You must know how, you know, you got to read a little Shakespeare so that you will know, like, well, God, if this is the best writing has ever been, what can I do with that, you know, to uh, turn it into a contemporary story or to take those same themes and put it in something I want to write? Um, that's important. And again, I can't say enough about just being willing to work as hard as you can and to also not ask people like me to read your scripts when you haven't read it and rewritten it a billion times. Don't bring your first draft of something to me. I'm not going to read it twice. So you better make sure everybody that you know Every writer you know, any person that really loves you and will tell you the truth have all said, yes, this is ready to show someone, you know, before you show it. Because often young writers also show their material too early before it's ready. What was the second question? Part B was? Well, we we hit, you know, 2016. It just went from Oscar so white to Oscar so black. So, I mean, is that that reactionary or, or have we reached a tipping point, do you think? Yeah, you know what? Um, I am by nature a you know a a positive person um, who believes that I can wheel almost anything into existence if I focus on it. So I reluctantly say to you, um, I think so much of it has to do with is so much of it is reactionary, and so and you don't want to be a fad. We as a people don't want to be a fad. So I always, my goal is like, I don't want to see, you know, Halle Berry win an Oscar and then no one else even be considered in that category for another 10 years. Um, But I'm also not saying that we want to be there when we haven't earned it. So, but I just believe I want to see us at the table um, normalized. And not, you know, black is the new black right now. Well, we don't want to be a fad. We want to be at the table on a regular and ongoing basis, not just when, you know, there's a lot of uh, diversity is the new thing. We don't want to be the new thing. We want to be for our excellence always considered. Yeah, it's, it seems pretty obvious. After the backlash of the Oscars so white, two years in a row right? yes. that that all the studios went into overdrive to find those movies that they could bring to, exactly into consideration mm-hmm. and and but what that proved is that there's so much talent out there ready to go that's oscar worthy it's there's no there's no you look at you look at the nominees this year i don't think there's anything that's questionable and that's that's why no and you know and that goes with any area of the business where, you know, you hear, well, we just couldn't find them. Whenever I hear that, I said, well, you should come and ask me because if I don't know, you know, what it is you need, I know someone who knows. Right. It's just about doing the hard work to look and to find us um, because we're out there, um, regardless of what it is that, that you need. And, and quite frankly, those are also the kind of elements that um, kind of issues, I'm sorry, that we're exploring on the quad, even within our own community, you know, it's, well, you know, we tried to find one who was really excellent, like, well, you have to look in non-traditional places. It's not that we don't exist, you just have to be willing to do the work to find us. As you can see by this year's Oscars, the work was done to find the projects. With Hidden Figures, 
crossing $100 million this week? Yes, come on. That's beautiful stuff right there. And it just makes me so happy like to be able to look at, take my nieces to see a movie with brilliant women who look like them. That's all, you know, the kids need it. instead of, for me, I feel very strongly about normalizing difference as opposed to asking us to be mainstream. I say everybody should celebrate. We should celebrate our differences. There's no reason why we should all have to behave the same or mainstream our behavior or our culture. Instead, you know, we should all be celebrating how everyone is different and that difference is beautiful. Wow, I'm loving this. I know you, you've got to go back. You're you're in a trailer now. Um, yes. <laughs> you're about to finish. How many more episodes? It's nine episodes for this run, and then yes, we're ra- we're wrapped with ten episodes total, and um, we're wrapping the tenth one. And I have to say, I'm so excited that Eric LaSalle, who you may remember from ER, um, is directing our season finale. And, you know, he's an amazing director, but of course, first the actor. So the actors are just loving him to death and feeling like, yes, one of us is here, you know, to direct, to direct it. So it's a wonderful and he's so good and so excellent. So I just feel so thankful that um, to have friends like that who I could say, please come and play with us. And he came and he is killing it. Fantastic. And and big shout out Philly representing with Rob Hardy there. Um, so uh, again, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm super excited. I hope everybody listening is amped and I want people to leave comments when they see the show because I, I know you're going to check them out. Yes, please leave comments. I really want to hear what people think. It's very important to me because in my opinion, you know, I, I'm in partnership and collaboration with the audience. So I, I really look forward to hearing what everyone thinks. Well, Ms. Henderson, thank you so much for your time. And uh, It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. I, I'm a fan, fan, fan. And so to like then be on and talking to you, like this is very cool. And we want our fans to be your fans and vice versa. So where can people find you? In the- it is a, a follow FDH, my initials, Felicia D. Henderson. So it's follow FDH on both Twitter and Instagram. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, love. Have, have a great day and thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to seeing what you think of the quad.